people when you make what we make at Pal's Books. Now we're definitely a lot better off with Local 5 than we were without Local 5, but that doesn't mean that it's not hard to pay the bills. It doesn't mean that most of the uh, workers don't still work paycheck to paycheck. So we really need your help if we're gonna have any sort of legitimate threat to management to say, yeah, we might hit the streets if you guys don't cooperate and don't try to give us a fair contract. We've already received a lot of support. I want to thank ILW Longshore Locals 23 from Tacoma, 19 from Seattle, Local 8 from Portland, and 4 from Vancouver. They've been incredibly generous with us, thank you. And also Jobs with Justice. So uh, up next, we have a very special reader. This is a Local 5 alumni and a current editor of Alignment Week. And uh, it's very true that he has a hard time opening his mouth or uh, putting pen to paper without pissing somebody somewhere off. So we're very happy to have him because he's a lot like Local 5 in that respect. Stefan Silvis. Uh, tonight's going to be a uh, Easter presentation, since uh, that's where we are. I'm going to bore you with uh, an essay that's going to be published. It will be upcoming in the next issue of Black Lamb, which is a local literary newspaper. And it's called Track Record. Universities and Hollywood are corrupting American culture and youth. While our enemies are stirring up poison gases and bacteria in satanic kitchens. But the good news is that Jesus Christ's return to Earth is imminent, as events in the Middle East clearly prove. Welcome to the prophetic year of 1943. Having recently discovered a cache of prophetic Protestant tracts dating from 1938 to 1945, I've been struck by the industriousness of right wing divines in keeping various books in the Bible, especially Daniel and the Book of Revelations, vigorously, if not strikingly, alive. The Word of God is precise and irrefutable. These Pentecostal and charismatic worthies cry through these holy chapbooks. Yet their lives seem to have been spent furiously retooling God's exactness as fresh news items altered the apocalypse's opening night and cast. As with the modern televangelists, pinpointing that magical moment when the earth shakes, the moon is bloodied, and dark clouds part for Christ's crash landing is vital, at least for selling tracks. But surely we would all profit in knowing when to stub out our joints, stash the porn, and fall to our humbled knees before that terrible hour. If only God's plans were less variable. A look at the Antichrist is a good place to start the study of tracks. William S. McBurney, in his Christ's Return in Facts and Photos, declares that none other than Mussolini is Satan's leading salesman. As for the eagerly awaited false prophet, there's the Pope at Il Duce's side. Unfortunately, McBurney's tract was released the same year, 1945, that Mussolini was strung up in a piazza in Milan with his mistress. Still, as Mussolini hung upside down, bleeding like a butchered hog, his arms did form a cross. No, says the Reverend Alexander Schiffner from that holy city of Spokane, Washington, Mussolini is the false prophet to the real Antichrist, who he names as Vladimir Letachowski. The obscure Lenachowski was a Polish Jesuit who rose to become, in the Reverend Schiffner's terms, the Black Pope, better known amongst his maniacal devotees as the leader of the Society of Jesus. This is futurist nonsense, cries the Reverend Fred J. Peters in his The Present Antichrist from 1943. Peters insists that the Antichrist is really an inanimate object, that is, the throne of St. Peter. Schiffner's theory of Letachowski's horrible rise is proof that the Jeremiah of Spokane has fallen prey to a Jesuit plot to divert attention away from his holiness's unholiness. Anyway, by this time, Letachowski has also kicked the bucket. Common sense finally does prevail 
in Lawrence and Vilma Booth's The Antichrist and the Armageddon from 1943, where communism is rightfully identified as the beast. This is the real king of the North from scripture, though both the Tsar and the Kaiser in pre-World War I era prophetic writing served in the same capacity. The Booths also give America its due as God's country, reviving the fraudulent 19th century tale of George Washington's angelic vision at Valley Forge. Washington's vision, supplied by an angel of the Lord who insisted upon addressing Washington as son of the Republic, confirmed America's special place in God's bosom, and warned that a future conflagration would test the young Republic's trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord. The Booths, of course, believed World War II to be that test, yet their grandchildren know better. Since 9-11, the fictitious Valley Forge Annunciation has been resurrected on numerous Christian and right-wing websites where it is treated as fact. But this is hardly the lone comparison one can find between this World War II era literature and the devout propaganda of today. Throughout McBurney's tract, Arabs are continually labeled as ignorant, inferior, backward. Words that the Cracker Grams, Billy and Son Franklin, are certainly familiar with, and which have aided Franklin in his decision to march 2,500 knuckle-dragging evangelicals into Iraq to bring Baptist cheer to suffering Basra. McBurney goes on, the Jews flowing into Palestine in the 1940s must be supported by the United States, though they must also be allowed to suffer for refusing to accept Jesus as their personal savior. Of all the tracts, it's Dan Gilbert's The Truth About Juvenile Delinquency from 1943 that comes closest to aping opinion found currently flowing from the Fox Network and federal bureaus. The enemies of God are the enemies of America, he says. Hitler and Tojo hate America because of our principles of honesty, liberty, and tolerance. This brag of tolerance is followed very shortly by this demand. The advocates of free love are the worst of traitors and the best friends of Japs. They should be interned with our enemies. Needless to remind you that the state of North Dakota has three weeks ago affirmed a law making it illegal for men and women to live together in sin. So it's good to see that free love is still being hounded from God's country. Next on Gilbert's hit list, was swing band orchestras, dispensers of hot music, jitterbug orgies, and violence. Dance, the Reverend Gilbert reminds us, is the gateway to hell. Still, our nation's campaign to cleanse the body politic of sin smudges is all for a good cause. In Rhapsodizing the Rapture, McBurney offers this homely vision of the end. Fancy sitting in the King David Hotel dining room in Jerusalem, McBurney invites us, eating beefsteak smothered in onions with Christ. Oh, when, sweet Jesus, when? Thank you, Stephen Silvis. You know, Stefan's emails back when he used to work in the uh, halls of Pals Books were quite memorable. In fact, he penned one of the absolute most classic all-time goodbye Pals kiss-off emails, which is worth looking at every once in a while for those of us that still work there. Ma Ford is going to be up now.